shots. Open door. Okay, so we're watching this active shooter down drill. Hall, hall. You can hear gunshots move. down the hallway. Move. Down the hall. Yeah, move. Move. In there, in there. I'm not putting up with this anymore. Five years. One down. Black over blue jeans. Got one down inside the hall. Room opens up deep right. They're going in. This is ALERT, the Advanced Law Enforcement Rapid Response Training Center. The FBI has named this training the national standard for how cops should respond to an active shooter. It's scary. How do you get people to overcome their natural responses? There's a term that we call stress inoculation. It's just like any other inoculation where you get a dose of something and your body builds up a tolerance to it. We have to do that with stress. It's going to be stressful. It's going to be chaotic. It's going to be confusing. Any human being doesn't instinctively want to run towards this and risk everything. But because somebody else's lives are at risk currently, we have to. The center was created over 20 years ago after the massacre at Columbine High School, which permanently changed how law enforcement responds to active shooters, from waiting for backup to confronting a shooter immediately. Are there ways to respond incorrectly? When it takes too long for us to figure out what's happening, there's a sea of things that we could choose to do, but there's one or two correct things initially, and that's stop the killing, stop the dying. If we do anything other than that, then we're wasting time and resources on things that are not gonna save as many lives as possible. In Uvalde, police arrived at the school two minutes after an 18-year-old entered the building and started firing. As the shooting continued, as many as 19 officers were inside the building in a hallway while children and teachers hid in classrooms calling 911. Still, the officers didn't breach the doors. For the benefit of hindsight, where I'm sitting now, of course it was not the right decision. It was a wrong decision, period. It took at least 75 minutes before officers unlocked the doors and took down the shooter. By then, 19 students and two teachers were dead. While ALERT didn't train the Uvalde police, the officers who responded had gone through a similar active shooter training just two months earlier, in March. When you look at what happened in Uvalde, there's a you know, very public conversation now about the response that went wrong. What is that like here, when you guys see that unfold? It's easy to get emotionally charged, and when you watch that, um, because you understand the tragedy across the board that's happening. But we have to be patient, we have to wait, get actual facts, data, um, and then we know what we're dealing with. This is something that it doesn't happen as often as the stuff we do day to day. Uh, traffic stops, take reports, investigate crimes of other natures that occur on a regular basis. What's required for, for us to be able to handle one of these is something totally different than what we do day to day. This is our breaching facade. So you can practice all kinds of breaching from ramming things to prying things open to uh, shotgun breaching, even explosive breaching on that. I would say almost every police department within 100 miles will come out here and do training. At this point in time, we trade more than 200,000 first responders representing every state in the country. Dr. Pete Blair has been studying what happens during mass shootings for over a decade. He literally wrote a book called Active Shooter Events and Response. What happens to people when they're in that real traumatic environment. So if you get under a high level of stress, your heart rate goes through the roof, right? You get the adrenaline dump, you have tunnel vision start to kick in, audio exclusion where you don't hear things very well. People can freeze up and go into a code black, we call it, where they're just not functional. And so you look at places like the fire service and, and other disciplines where they're training almost every day, if not every day. It's always ongoing, there's always something happening. So often in law enforcement, training is a separate special event that happens and we do that training and then we move on and we go back to doing our job and then that's kind of it. Is it possible to really ever be prepared for something like this happening in real life? Ultimately, will you ever know until you encounter that situation on the day? And the answer is you, you can't. You can't know for sure until you've encountered it. All we can do is provide you with training prepare you for it as best we can so that you know what you're trying to do, you've experienced something close to it before, and hopefully on that day you'll be able to respond appropriately. Despite the tens of millions of dollars poured into national training programs, law enforcement officers have been slow to respond before Uvalde. The school safety officer at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas was charged with neglect for staying outside during that attack, 
17 people died. And 31 police officers were sued for not protecting the dozens who were killed and wounded at the Pulse nightclub in Orlando. A lot of people watching the response in Uvalde, I think, have lost a lot of faith in police response. How do you convince people that it's worth continuing to invest in training? What else would you do is the first question, like, okay, what, what's the solution? Then you're going to say, we don't provide any training, we don't spend any effort on it, and see if things get worse. But in some sense, we've accepted the reality that the mass shooting is going to happen. It's just about how many people die. For us, it's about how do we respond better to limit that. The solution to me is that we need more training, and simply checking the box and saying that I want to active shooter training at some point in my career is not enough to prepare you to respond to that event. You have to practice those things. And that's why we are big proponents of policing moving toward a training culture where that training is happening all the time. I'm Michael Learmonth, Editor-in-Chief of Vice News. Too often, traditional news outlets shy away from the real stories and experiences of those living through global conflicts, not Vice News. Our reporters are on the ground, fearlessly covering the human stories that shape our world. You and millions of others can continue to read, watch, and listen to Vice News for free. But we hope you'll consider making a one-time or ongoing contribution of any size at vice.com slash contribute. Every contribution, no matter how big or small, helps support the journalism Vice News brings to you every day. Thank you.